Mulweeny, Mulweeny, Mulweeny. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back to Fresh Perspective. And uh, I want you to help me welcome Cornels Schabort, friend of many years and a very interesting person. Should I say character, Cornels? Interesting character? character? Yes, you may, you may. You may call me a character. <laughs> I even drew a little picture. You can't see if you're listening to the audio, but of Cornels, very accurately depicting him with more hair though. Yes, but just give me two more months of lockdown and it will be 100% accurate. <laughs> okay. Kurnia, I'd like to start with an easy question. Everyone yes. knows the answer to this question is, what is it that you do? Well, I am... It, it depends on, on how you, you, you frame, frame the question, but to get bread on the table, I'm a, a lecturer in, in chemical engineering. Uh, at the university, uh, at the Northwest University in Pochevstra. So I teach, but then also on the side, I'm also involved with, in a local church there, a duet congregation, and in a part-time uh, manner, I also teach there. So I think the answer would be I teach. It just depends yes. on who am I teaching. I'm either teaching students in the classroom or I'm teaching students in in the church hall if if that's if that makes sense yes but yes amongst other things i just like doing fun uh i missed the stage though so that's that's bad we should someday make a, a comeback again of lachness i think that's that's not a bad idea to to get everybody on stage again yes so, so for those of you who don't know what lachness is um please unsubscribe from this channel and don't listen to the <laughs> podcast ever again. <laughs> now, Lachnes is an improvisation group that Cornelius and I was part of. So we used to perform on stage together, improvising uh, in the likes, like, like whose line is it anyway? Only better and in Afrikaans. It was just much better and in Afrikaans, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you teach. I teach, oh, that, yes. I like that. I like that you summarize it or, or bring it all together like that. So what is it? What? Why? Why do you teach? What do you love about it? <laughs> to me, what I love about teaching most is, first of all, in teaching others, you teach yourself. Um, it, it, it's a never ceasing, seizing, either one of those. I'll have to go and Caesar. I think that. the word is Caesar. 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 From the days of Caesar. Now, it, it's a... <laughs> A continuum where you learn in order to teach others that's that's one thing but what I love about teaching is taking especially difficult concepts breaking it down and making it more digestible to whoever is in front of you and I, and I think that's one thing and, and another thing about that is in doing that you instill a love for the specific field of study um, and I've seen that if, if you can break something open if you can open it up to people they will show more interest in that field, whether it be whatever. But yes, taking something difficult, breaking it down, making it uh, less complex to understand. So, okay, there's two things. You like, you like the fact that you learn as you teach, but you also like the fact that you can take complex ideas, like in engineering or within the Bible, exactly. and break it down exactly. so people can understand it. And you say that that, you feel like that creates a love for the subject matter, whatever it might be, Well, with the student. For me personally, definitely that's true of me. And what I've seen is especially um, for people, sometimes something is dull subject matter. And then you start delving in and you start asking questions, which is also a very important thing. And you actually teach people to ask questions because I think that's the big problem. People don't ask enough questions. They just go through life and they feel... I am not allowed to ask questions and I'm just like, no, ask these questions because as long as there are questions, there will be a, a search for, for the answers. And, and that's good. That to me. And, and I think that's where this love for a subject field can be born out of asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how did you end up being a teacher? Well, that is... Uh, that's not something... how your path started, right? First, you, you no, were that's not how my path a started. performer it's... in Lachnes and toured yes. the world. That's true. Yes. Making millions. Um, making millions. That was, that was quite nice. No, uh, Omi, it's uh, something that goes back many, many years. And um, 
you know this, and I'll say this for the audience to hear, you've played a significant role in this specific area of my life um, where you saw something in me that was not necessarily uh, seen by others, even in the church community. And I don't hate them. They just did not see it. Um, <laughs> you don't hate them. <laughs> I think the, the, the love for teaching was something that, that came from school days. That's, that's something that was always there. But specifically with regards to developing this and, and growing in this, that goes back about 18 years where I was given the, for the first time an opportunity to actually teach in a more formal setting. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about, especially going back 18 years, what I loved about that was there was a community uh, and within that community, there was the possibility to, to teach and there was a good loop. There was a feedback loop where teaching was complemented with perhaps try a bit this, perhaps do this, perhaps do this. That's great. That's awesome. So there was this whole feedback loop that, that helped me a lot in growing as a teacher. Um, so, so that I would say. And then what's actually funny, um, when I worked for Sassel, yes, I worked for Sassel after leaving the university, um, I had this whole idea that I will work back my, my, my bursary, I had a Sassel bursary, I will work it back. And then afterwards, I would go into full-time ministry and become a youth pastor. And that's not how life panned out. Um, in the end, I did end back in, in Pochestrum, but I ended in, in the role as a teacher, but not as a full-time paid spiritual teacher, more a, a chemical engineering teacher. But then again, it's, it's, it's funny and it's, it's wonderful in the same sense how these things come together. And, and it's the, the, the longer I'm progressing on this road, <clears throat> the, the distinguishing factors between these two, it, the boundaries is less vague. I mean, it, teaching is, is, is a general principle. But yes, and, and how these two things actually, um, a natural talent and a spiritual gift, those two actually coming together. And, and that to me is, is, is wonderful. And I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful to you and I'm thankful to others who have crossed my path and have helped me to become who I am today. And it, it, it's something that you can't do this alone. You need people who act as mentors, who act as people giving input and having that feedback loop. Otherwise, you'll just become stagnant and it will just plateau and just be a straight line. That makes a lot of sense. And thanks for, for acknowledging my role in it, Cornelius. I think no, uh, I will... making it bigger than it, than it was, I was just like... Uh... No, it's, it's, it's much bigger than you think it is. <laughs> I mean, it, no, but I'm, I'm, I'm serious. It's, 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 it's one of those things. Um, it's, you need that in life. And I think that's a principle. You saw something in me that others did not see. That, that was your role in that, that part of my life. And, and I believe everybody on earth... I wish it for everyone on earth that there will be some mentor crossing their paths or just somebody speaking life into a specific situation and just helping them see what they cannot see at that point in time. I, I think that's, that's that. So no, I, I, I will always cherish this and I, I always share that as part of my, my life story. Even after 18 years, it's, it's still part of the story. <laughs> Thanks, Cornelius. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, right. But what, what makes a teacher great then? I mean, what makes a teacher great and, and helps them or enables them to actually, you know, um, get what they are trying to teach across and get students mm. excited. Mm. Cause I like the, the fact that you, yeah. you say that the lines get blurred. It's teaching is teaching. Exactly. So it's about what, you know, distilling that complex thing into something understandable Just and digestible and, yes. and sharing it in a way that the student goes like, yeah, I, I, I'm excited. I get it. Yes. Sorry, because we are on Zoom. I just missed you for one minute. <laughs> <laughs> so you just, <laughs> Only for one so minute. you just have to go back one minute and just say, because it was like a question and I was starting answering and then I realized, now we missed one another. Oh. Just one minute back and just rephrase the question. <laughs> All right. So I was born in 1977. <laughs> <laughs> on the 5th of March. Oh, yes. Is it too far. Too far back. All right. Too far back, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, what makes a good teacher? That's, that's the, the core of what I was asking. I was just mm -hmm. elaborating and explaining what I mean by the question is what makes you, what makes it that you are able to actually take a complex thing, condense it 
and keep students engaged? What are those principles? Well, first of all, regardless of what your teaching style is, you should be passionate about what you are teaching. I think nothing can be more terrible than listening to somebody teaching on a top topic that that person is not necessarily passionate about. But what, so what does it mean to it's be much, passionate? Well, passion, the word passion, of course, is used in a bad sense many times because passion comes from the Latin word parte, which means willing to die for. Now, I think we, we are very passionate about things, but I think we use that word wrongly. So, but yes, let's, let's allow this, but passionate is, is to be something that goes beyond just, I have to teach this, now I've taught this, now it's done. It's being the continuous scholar. So I've taught something, but yes, my students will delve deeper into this, but I myself, I will also go and delve in deeper. There's still more to the subject matter that can be discovered. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a never ending process, but sometimes it's just in the way that some people just radiate that, that the love that they have for that specific um, subject field and it's contagious. And I've, 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 it's very much, it's, it's dependent on the subject matter, but it's also dependent on the individual. And that I've seen. And I've heard that also in my 10 years of, of teaching. Sometimes you get people who will tell you outright, they will tell you, listen here, I hate the subject, but it's just the way in which you presented this just made me love the subject. Even though I will never continue with the subject, but it's just the way in which you taught that. So I think there's a very big responsibility on the shoulders of, of teachers to at least show a love for the field and, and present it in a way that, 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 that con con conveys that message. Because specifically as a chemical engineer, I've seen many times, and I'm, I'm now walking on the field of, of chemistry, for instance, you have teachers who have to teach chemistry on, at school level. But the teachers themselves, they hate chemistry. Mm. And then that hate is also transferred. And you have potential doctors, engineers, physiotherapists, uh, astronauts, all these people who will never become that because of the hate that a certain teacher had with regards to a certain subject. Mm. So I think you are not doing that field justice in, in presenting something that you don't love. Um, so, so that I would say is one thing, but then a second thing, and, and this is a, a difficult thing and it's good if you understand this, not all people learn in the same way. Mm. So if all, all people don't learn in the same way, then the same teaching method will also not be applicable to everyone. And yes, th that's one of the challenges as a teacher because my style, I love my style. But that does not necessarily mean that every student or church congregant will love that style. And it's actually something I, I visited Florida last year, not the one in Johannesburg, the one in, in the States. And I actually crossed paths with uh, another pastor. It's a very long story. He's from Durban. And then he actually made a point and it helped me so much. And he reminded me of this fact and it's actually a logical thing some people are more visual learners other more audio other more physical whatever it is but the point is he said that within the teaching community and again regardless of whether i'm talking about the church or the university the same applies you will have specific learners who are very diverse now the question is how do we go about as teachers with regards to this? Well, I think, first of all, you need to be cognizant of the fact that not everybody will love your style. And I think that's good. And I think it's okay. So don't take offense if people don't like your teaching style. It's just not the teaching style they like. That does not mean the teaching is bad. And that does not mean that you are bad. It's just that's not their style. And it means that that same work can be presented in another way. And guess what? suddenly uh, that same person who hated version one now loves version two. It's not that the content changed. It's just that the style changed. So, and in understanding that there was a, a time not that long ago when I had this conflict in myself, when I listened to other teachers, regardless of university or church, and I would say, no, but I, I, I don't think this is a good teacher. And then I realized I was wrong. 
Mm. I am basing my evaluation on my personal teaching style. So what I'm actually saying, and I, I think it's, be honest, that person is not similar to me. That's what I'm saying. But I'm not saying, if, if I say that person is a bad teacher, I should be very wary of those words because it's not necessarily true. There will be learners out there who will say, that person is the best teacher in the whole wide world. And I would just say, but why? And then I understood. We are diverse. We have different learning styles. We have different teaching styles. Embrace that. And I believe that the challenge comes in. I mean, you, you can take this point very far and talk about love languages. I mean, it, it, it's the same principle. I mean, just because your love language differs from your partner's love language does not mean that their love language is bad. It just means that it will take a bit more effort to communicate love. And I mm -hmm. think with teaching, it's the same. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you will have to deliberately change your style to accommodate a few. But I think that the reality is, I think it's very difficult, if not impossible, to try to embrace everyone in the same same time slot. I think that's, that's, that's a bit of a challenge. And I think if you can manage to do that, that would make you a teacher of teachers. Um, I, I do believe that. Okay. Yes. Well, there's a lot there and I want to ask a few <laughs> questions. No, I love it. I love it. So, uh, yes. so one thing is, is a passion and caring about the subject matter. What? Yes. And then at being able to adapt to different students needs within limits. Yes. Yes. So uh, how, what's the role that caring for the student plays within that? So maybe I yes. can justify the question a bit or motivate yeah, it. Justify the question. What, 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 I've, what, what I've found is when I do a presentation, I go speak to a group of people. So it's not necessarily a, a, necessarily a class that I'm doing weekly or whatever. I'm invited to do a speaking event, whatever. I go there, I do it. And the times that I prepare myself with the PowerPoint and the content and everything, and I'm focused on that, I'm doing, and I present it, it feels, afterwards it feels like it was okay. Mm, mm. But when I do the effort and put in the work to, to you know, make sure that my presentation is good enough, and, and I make sure that, ask myself the question, who will be sitting in front of me and do I care mm -hmm. about them? Do I care yeah. that they learn what I'm trying to teach or the principles I'm trying to convey? That makes a major difference. And I've, I've um, spent lots of time preparing my presentation and then after a while I'm like, I'm not caring about the, the people I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. And I chuck the whole mm -hmm. thing and I just pitch up them mm -hmm. and I just talk to them. And that's mm -hmm. more effective and potent in my view, and the yes. feedback I'm getting. So yes. that's why I'm asking that question. What, yes. As a as a as a, 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 a lecturer at a university, but also a teacher in, within a church, what role does that play? So I'm going to motivate it some more. Within a yes. church, I, I know that you have to care about, you know, the congregation. So that's kind of, kind of it goes with the terrain. But as a lecturer. It can be hard to care for some students. <laughs> <laughs> it can also be difficult to care for some church congregants. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Yes. Um, I'm going to be that guy and, and start with a quote. To just agree with what you're saying. I think it was Floyd McClung in one of his books who wrote, they don't care how much you know mm -hmm. until they know how much you care. Uh, and that's it's a simple quote to remember. And it, it links to that. Of course, within the church boundaries, it's easier because relationship is expected, if I can put it that way. Mm. Within the university, of course, it's a more professional environment. Yeah. But that does not you mean actually you don't expect care. a relationship. <laughs> exactly. But that does not mean they cannot be a caring environment. Mm. Um, it just looks differently. And I think it, it looks differently. But it, it's actually interesting. Um, one of these things have changed over the last year in my own life. Um, there's a new role I'm, I'm, I'm taking on within the, the school. So within the faculty of the School of Chemical and Minerals Engineering. And I'm the undergraduate program manager. So what we do is um, the school director and myself, at the end of each semester, uh, we have to look at all the marks of the students and we have to identify where there are problem areas. And we've introduced a new system where students 
get warnings. It has been like that since the beginning of time. But for the first time, we are actually making sure that they get the message and then they have to come to us. They have to schedule a meeting. And then we actually have a meeting. And I've been doing this now about two rounds. It takes a lot of time. So care is spelled time, that whole thing. <laughs> so you have to sit with these students. And sometimes I cannot tell you how much my opinion has changed about students just because I've taken interest in hearing what's going on in their lives. You sit there with a the student and you ask the student, listen, yeah, I look at your trick results. You passed all your subjects with distinctions. Suddenly I look now here and I see you've not passed the subject this semester. What, what, what is up with that? And then we try to um, uh, refer them to TUSO, which is the old ingrip. It's psychological assistance. But, but the point is sometimes it's simple things just like, you know what? Um, I got a laptop at the beginning of the year and it was stolen. And we sit there and we're just like, but why didn't you speak up? And then the, it, it's the thing, but I did not know I could speak up. And just having that fulfillment of telling a student, listen here, yeah, but we are not just here to make you a theoretical chemical engineer. We actually do care. And it's in the best interest for us and for you, for you to pass these modules. So what has changed in, in my way of looking at students, because the problem is if you're in education, if you're in a teaching role, and every year you have a new group of people sitting in front of you, I think it's, it's difficult and it's a challenge, especially if you have bigger classes, that you tend to sometimes lose a bit of that and your student in front of you becomes, and I'm, I'm, I'm very honest now, um, just becomes another client sitting in front of you who has to pass your module and then they'll move on and you'll get new students. So I think it's, it's a big, big challenge and, and, and I, I'm starting to find a balance in that. Um, but yes, I do believe what you're saying is true. If you don't care about students, they will not care about your module. And, and that's taking me back to what I said earlier where I, when I said that some of these students, they love you as a teacher and hence they love the module. They, they perform well in the module mm -hmm. without loving the module so much. Mm -hmm. But they just, it's, it's a show of affection backwards. I, I, I'm showing my affection to you as lecturer and appreciation because you have shown affection in, in this direction. But it's a bit of a challenge. And, and as I say, yes, I'm, I'm starting to realize that. And I think one of the things that we need to be reminded of, I'm, I'm trying to, to preach to myself actually in saying this, in being reminded of who is the person sitting in front of you. If you realize, listen here, yeah, this is not just a surname, a name, and a student number. This is actually a human being with a history, with a background. And I think the problem we do often stumble upon is um, we make assumptions. We make assumptions about people sitting in front of us. And because we make these assumptions, we treat them according to our assumptions. And then you start realizing, but listen, yeah, this person sitting in front of me, they don't have money, for instance. Or he had this laptop, but he sold the laptop, took the money and sent it back home. And you're like, but that's stupid. Yes, it is stupid unless mom and dad has no work and they have no money and that's the only choice. Mm -hmm. And you hear these things and you're just like, oh man, there's, there's so much to be done. There's so much need out there and, and it's right here in front of us. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that, it's, it's a funny concept. But the masks, we're all wearing masks now um, in this COVID-19 time. Uh, I think they're also wearing masks on a deeper level we hide behind masks we are not true and hence um i don't know what's going on in your life you don't know what's going on in my life hence there can be no relationship and, and then we just operate based on on assumptions mm -hmm. and hence we cannot care uh, so i think caring will mean to take an active decision to know what's going on in your life and yes we can talk a lot about how does that practically pan out in a class of 50 students how does that work uh, it's, those are the challenges but i agree with what you're saying no caring if you don't care they don't care that's 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 the point that's the bottom taken. line yeah yes. um, yeah i think that the quote was from um the father heart of god by floyd mcclung which is a great book wonderful um but uh, I was wondering if you've read anything by Ken Robinson. He wrote the book 
yeah. Element. He also has a TED talk um, about education. Um, and Element is about. I'm writing it down. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You should read that. I think you'll find it interesting. But Element is about. Ken, what's the surname? Ken Robinson. Sorry, so Robinson. Okay. Now just making a note. Like Robinson Crusoe, but they're not related. <laughs> 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 but he, he talks in Element. Element, he talks about the different ways that people actually learn. Okay. And, and I think he lists seven if I remember correctly. But I want to share a short story which I think you'll appreciate, linking it with both teaching and, and the church. Um, he tells a story in his TED talk about a little a, a drawing class. Mm -hmm. And the teacher, you know, tells the children they can draw anything they want. And they start drawing and she's walking, you know, through the, the desk and looking at everyone's pictures. And she asks whatever her name was, little Susan, what are you drawing? And she says, it's a picture of God. And the teacher goes, oh, but no one knows what God looks like. And little mm -hmm. Susan goes, well, they will in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> which i think is absolutely brilliant <laughs> well in a minute i mean i'm drawing it now so <laughs> i really love that but 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 what he's po the point he's making is that that when we are smaller you know children we take a chance mm -hmm. we we, we yes. take a, a stab at something we try but as we grow up, we become more fearful to actually try to ask and to just put a creative idea out there or a question which might be vulnerable out there. Um, yeah, so, so that was kind of my, my thought about that. I also wanted to ask you in regards to teaching, I mean, what what's the responsibility of the student? Because uh, mm. it can be very hard work to listen. So yes, mm. the, the teacher should, um, you know, have a passion for the subject matter and mm. present it in an interesting way yes. and should care for you. What's the responsibility of the student and what do you notice happens there? Even though all of these things are in place, some students just don't engage. What are your thoughts on and why that happens? I think there is a fundamental flaw in the South African school system. I'm making a very bold statement now. Mm -hmm. And the problem we have is, is the teacher or the lecturer is seen as the sage on the stage. Mm -hmm. You are the person, you know everything. Um, I'm here to listen. I'm just here to listen. I don't have to participate. I don't have to engage. I'm just sitting here. And I do believe a good teacher, and that's my philosophy. Um, again, these words are coming from research that I've I believe a good teacher is not supposed to be a sage on the stage, but rather a guide on the side. And that brings us to a very popular word nowadays, which is called self-directed learning. And I believe that we can go a long way in the South African school system, education system as a whole, if we can, instead of trying to dump... Could, could you just quickly yeah. explain what self-directed learning is? The self-directed learning is as the name says. I am self-directed. So what this means, if, if you teach me how and I will do it then. So the long and the short is the execution will, will lie with me. So for instance, let me put a broad statement. Um, I show you how to do research, but because you are a self-directed learner, you have an interest in the oceans of the world. But because I have taught you how to acquire information, how to go about, you will be able to, on your own, go and obtain that information. Okay. Yes, you might ask some questions along the way, but that's the whole point, because the, the, the advantage of that is, that means Learning does not stop because that's the big problem. I go to university, we now stop. No, it never stops. But self-directed learning means I'm in a situation now. I'm going now to the workplace. Now I'm in a workplace. Suddenly walks into my office and says, listen, yeah, it's COVID-19. We can only do uh, these things. And you're like, okay, but I'm a self-directed learning. I do research. I see you have Zoom, you have Discord, you have Microsoft Teams. You have all these options and you do an evaluation. You go back, you present a report to the to the board that I've, I've, I've compared all these specific things uh, and I think we should go with this option. 
Mm. Nobody has taught that person to do that. That's a self-directed learner who has acquired information that was not to his or her disposal before the time. So we can cut a lot on theory. So there's a lot of theory we have in our school system, just theory, theory, theory. And I'm just like, wouldn't it be better to have one module, for instance, where you teach somebody how to obtain the information and then say, listen, yeah, those of you who are interested in geography, boom, you can apply it in that field. Those of you who want to do history, go. And, and you rather give them the skills, the tools, and not just memorizing the first reference of the Republic of South Africa. I mean, just memorizing facts. How is that improving me as a being? Yes, it's good for the trivia evening at the bar. Yes, and I can win 500 rand. But I mean, just knowing useless facts, instead of saying, listen, yeah, I cannot tell you who was the first five presidents of South Africa, but give me two minutes and I'll be able to tell you because I know how to obtain that information. That to me is more valuable, the, the skill than just being a, a walking encyclopedia. Uh, so I, I think like the way you differentiate that, that, between information yes. and, and skill. Teach exactly. the skill yes. versus teaching yes. the information. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and that's what self-directed learning is a skill. You become a lifetime scholar. And then the advantage of that is if somebody is a self-directed learner, that person can achieve much more because then there's, there's no limits. Because currently, if you are information bound, I'm bound by the syllabus. I'm bound by whatever is chapter one, two, three. But now, because I'm a self-directed learner, I'm not interested in the South African history, for instance. I want to know about the United States. Then I can do that because I know where to get the information that's reliable. So, yes, I, I, I think there are various advantages related to that method. Uh, what I want to get back to is we are not there yet. Yes, in many cases we are there. So the current state, the status quo, I would say at this point in time, is one more of spoon-fed students in, in many ways. And, and that to me is a big problem because those are not effective people in the workplace globally. Um, I mean, and, and South Africa is lagging behind. The rest of the world is not on a spoon-fed basis approaching life. They are more on a skills-focused, self-directed learning basis. So, but the problem is now, now you get a school system, education system, how does it work? Uh, it's called teaching to the test. So mm -hmm. I coach my students to write exams and they all pass with distinctions and those distinctions mm. don't mean anything. And many times when people state these things, they're like, yeah, but you're just saying that because perhaps you did not do, do good at school. I did do good at school. I uh, did do well at school. Is it well or good? You see there, it's a big problem. <laughs> but the point I want to make is obtaining distinctions does not necessarily mean, what, is it, what does it translate into? You have memorized a couple of exam papers. You were able to memorize 50 facts for your history paper. Well done. You're a good parrot. That's what mm. you are. And, 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 and I know people will say I'm being very harsh now. I'm just like, I believe we can spend less time in school and deliver pupils who are much more um, able to, to do things in life. And, and be able to contribute to society. I'm, I'm just thinking there are better ways. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just this whole thing about, nobody wants to take a step back and say, no, but perhaps we must rethink this whole model. Um, I don't know. It's, mm. It makes sense. I mean, the, the school system we have currently was designed for the industrial age. It was designed exactly. to equip people to work in a factory. Exactly. To kind of just continue the factory mindset. So uh, it did work well. To, to educate the masses to be able to do low skills, low level skilled work. But I mean, we live in a completely different age now. Information is not the issue because information is exactly. accessible. Exactly. Um, and yeah, but, but, and there's also, uh, I want to distinguish between being able to, to get the information to answer a question and oh, yes. learning something. Mm. Okay. There's another distinction. So now we're getting, mm. Hmm. We're now talking about even a higher level of thinking. And I'm, I'm struggling yes. with that because I'm struggling with that at this point in time with my students. So one question I like asking in, in, in exam papers or tests is critically evaluate the following statement. 
And that is a higher level of cognitive engagement with information. It's one thing to get the information. I totally agree. But now you have to be able to critically evaluate that. And that is a skill that's very scarce. Mm -hmm. I don't see that very often. I'm very serious now. People have a, they struggle with engaging with information and in a civil way, having debates or having an opinion and saying, listen, yeah, I hear what you're saying and you are saying this, this, this. And those are all good grounds for what you're saying. I'm saying this, this, this. And I feel stronger about this. You have your opinion. I have my opinion, but I feel... And, and I do believe that's one of those skills that, that's more required. But that, that's something that you need to be taught. That, that's, it's a thinking way. It's an approach to life. And that's more philosophical. That's, that's on a much higher level than just memorizing facts. Um, but yes, I love that. I love it personally. I love that. But I, you don't find that very often. Um, uh, even is that with, skill something that, that can be taught? Well, if I think about this... And how? How, how do we do that? I, I think it can be taught. If you create an environment from a young age already, and it can start in the family, where people sit around the table, which is always a good thing, and you just start discussing topics. And you just start discussing, listen here, do you think that uh, it's a good idea that is a ban on selling cigarettes at this point in time. And you can have a whole discussion about that and allow all the opinions around it. And I, I do believe that the adult or the more mature person, which is not necessarily always the adult, but the more mature person <laughs> will have to then facilitate the, the whole discussion and say, oh, but that's a valid point. And if somebody attacked that person to guide them and say, listen, yeah, I, I can hear you don't agree with what this person is saying, but that does not mean that that is not a valid point. Mm. So, yes, you can state your opinion and you can state your fact without uh, attacking the person. So I think it is something that can be taught from a young age, from the family, and it can go to school. I, I mean, it can be so much fun. Imagine you have these kind of discussions in class where you discuss relevant topics about what's going on in the country. I'm just not thinking in one line. And allow people to have opinions. The, the, that will force you to acquire the knowledge before the time. I mean, you will not be able to participate if you don't already have as a prerequisite the information. So you will have to know what's going on around you and then you can participate. And um, I think that's something, if, you, if, if that skill is, is, is taught, you'll have much more mature people. And I've, I've picked up the times I've been in the States, I've seen in the family system, they, they, they are leaning towards that, encouraging opinion, encouraging people to speak out. And I've, I've seen that. And to me in South Africa, it's more, no, no, shh, don't, don't talk. Mm. Let's, no, don't talk about these things. We don't, we don't talk. It's, it's not politically correct. We don't discuss this. We just, and then we have these bad Bryflace discussions, which is not necessarily always good. But yes, but, but you hear what I'm saying? I, I think it is something that can be acquired. I do believe it's something that can be taught. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I also like the fact that, that when you're listening to someone and you validate their opinion, so saying exactly. that makes sense because you are you know, supporting your opinion with exactly. reasons for that opinion or certain kind of facts, when you validate someone's opinion, saying that does make sense, doesn't mean that you agree. Exactly. And, people and, and you're, stuck, you know, you're touching on a, on a very, very, very important point, and especially for the church. And, and that's, uh, I can totally see that. Just because I agree with you, oh, yeah, exactly what you're saying. I can agree with you or disagree with you. It does not change my heart towards you. Mm. So, there are some things, and I think it's the Moravians who said this, in essential things, unity, in non-essential things, liberty, in all things, love. And I think the problem is, uh, especially within the church sometimes, we want to classify everything as essential. And I'm like, I don't think so. I think there are some things that are not essential, and we can have liberty with regards to differentiating views on, on these things. So, it, but it's applicable to everything. And I think just treating people a bit more humane it's a good way of starting that. To say, listen, yeah, I hear what you're saying. And, and using the Imago principle, so what I hear you are saying is A, B, C, D, E. That does not mean 
I agree one inch with what you're saying, but at least you've been heard and you cannot accuse me of not listening. Mm -hmm. And just by having a platform where people speak and where they are heard immediately changes the animosity that might be there. And people are like, okay, I'm, I'm fine. I'm walking away from this and we still don't agree, but he's a very nice guy. Mm -hmm. and, and that's good. I mean, we don't need to convince every single person in the world to think the same way that we do. And I'm glad about that. The world would be so boring if everybody agreed on every single thing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that was the plan. And I don't think that's, I mean, it's taking me back to the beginning of this discussion. The world is diverse. Creation is diverse. People are diverse. So respect diversity. Mm. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to just go back to the student's responsibility, right? Yes. Okay, uh, because yes. it's hard work to really learn something. You can, you can regurgitate information, but to, to really learn something on a level that you can, critically evaluate or have an opinion, mm -hmm. you have to be able to digest that. Exactly. What, what are the skill set required for that? What's, what is the skill set required to be able to get information, digest information, and then use it to critically evaluate or formulate an, an unique mm -hmm. opinion or personal opinion? Again, there are a couple of possibilities and I'm thinking about one now. And that for instance would be, um, there's a lot of theory that needs to be understood for a certain distillation column. Let's talk very specific. So you have this distillation column and we have to determine the sequence in which these distillation columns are set up. Now, there is what's called heuristics. A decision tree, how you decide this comes before that, that comes before that, etc. So they have the responsibility to go through the theory. Okay, now we get into the class. Now I put this example up, which I've not seen before, and I tell them, you already have the theory. Let's apply the theory now. I want to see how you're thinking. So I would subdivide them into groups, and I would tell them, listen here, I give you 10 minutes, apply that. And then we'll have the discussion, and then we will have a reasoning. And then I would say, okay, so what is the first rule we have with heuristics? And they would say, remove all corrosive materials first. And I say, okay, so which one of these, where do we want to do this? Okay, option one, two, and eight is a good option. Okay, everybody agrees. No, I don't agree. Why don't you agree? But what about this and that? So there's a, an interaction, mm. but it's not me talking. It's me providing a learning opportunity uh, by giving a, a real life example and asking them to apply what they've already acquired now in, in, this, in this case. That's, that's one thing. And the nice thing about these things, some of these questions are open-ended. There's not just one correct answer. And you need to tell them that. Listen, yeah, there's not correct and wrong. They, it depends on the situation. I mean, in, in our case, you have a, a, a problem where you need to uh, put in a heat exchanger. Okay, you can use cooling water for that, but you can also use some exotic coolant now you can use the exotic coolant you will need a smaller heat exchanger but the coolant costs a lot of money or you can build a much more expensive big heat exchanger but the water is dirt cheap so you need to sensitize them and then you say but that's just cost and then i'm like but what about the environment and then you talk about that and ethical issues and that so we you will need to guide them and throw these things in because remember if you're already a chemical engineer these things come natural if you're still a student you need to be reminded. So it's, it's a process. I think that's, the, that's the, the big thing. It's a process. And you need to ascertain who's sitting in front of me, where are they now? And sometimes you need to throw in more and sometimes you need to throw in less. But it's, it's encouraging them to learn. It's encouraging them to ask the questions and asking them why they are not asking questions when they are supposed to be asking questions. That's another thing. Yeah. And, and let's talk about mindset. I don't know if you've come across the book by Carol Dweck called Mindset. No? No. Cornelius, you can't own <laughs> chemical engineering books and the book. <laughs> <laughs> so, Carol, <laughs> I was born to lead, book. not to read. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, these are readers, Cornelius. Let's, let's just put that out there. 
it's a podcast, not a readcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so yes. <laughs> Carol, <laughs> yes. did a lot of research um, in the education world, and now her research uh, um, is being applied in different spheres of life, including sport and business. But yes. education is kind of where it started. And she distinguishes between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. So fixed mindset is, I, I believe that I'm born, my abilities are innate, I was born with it. So either I have the ability to be a chemical engineer, or let's, engineer. let's take another example, to do maths, or I don't. Okay. Mm-hmm. I was born that way. Yep. Or be good at, at sport or not. And whether you believe that you are bad at something, that's a fixed mindset, and we can all see that that's bad. But also when you believe that you are born good at something, that's also a fixed mindset and it's also not good, not healthy. Because Mm -hmm. then you think that it's something that you have that cannot improve, that cannot develop. And it causes Mm -hmm. you to shy away from certain things, from challenges. Because um, if I believe I'm good at something and it's a challenging thing, I might be exposed at not being good at it. And that'll be bad for my self-esteem. Feedback. Mm. I'll avoid certain feedback, but these these kind of students and people flourish in the test system because they can they can uh, do the test, get the result, and feel good. But they were also um, they're more likely to cheat in the fixed mindset because what if I get a bad mark mm. and then you know once again I'm exposed to not being clever or smart or whatever. So they might even cheat mm. to be able to uphold that, that image, that facade of I'm, I'm smart. Whereas the growth mindset on the other hand is skills are built. So I can learn to be good at maths. I can, it, it is a skill that I can develop over time. I can learn to be a better athlete. And that mindset um, is created through feedback as well from, mm-hmm. from the start. So when we tell a child that, you know, you are clever, mm-hmm. that can yes. create a fixed mindset. But if you tell, or stupid, of course, but mm-hmm. if you yes. tell someone that you work very hard at this and look at the results you got, now you, you developing mm-hmm. the growth mindset because you're telling the child, it's the effort that you put in that gets you the result. Mm-hmm. So maybe I'm, you know, um, that's the summary of the book from, from my side, but still read it. There's some, you know, there's a few, <laughs> You send this as more in the book. It sounds like such a good summary. I mean, I cannot beat that. <laughs> Not in that short time. <laughs> please read, please read that book. It's brilliant. Um, but I was, I just wanted to put it out there and and and, and uh, hear your opinion on. Have you seen this play out with students? Where you get students like you feel like you are just going to be left behind, no matter what my teaching style is, no matter how much I care, no matter what. And that might be attributed to the fixed mindset. Yeah, on an individual basis, I've, I've definitely come across this. Um, but it's sometimes it, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult thing. It's a difficult, difficult thing because sometimes those, the fixed, that mindset has been fixed for many years. Remember, by the time they get to university, they are at least 90 18 years of age, minimum 18, some of them 17, but that's, that's their age. And some of those things, it, it's so, it's, it cuts to the core. It's a deep thing. And to fix that in a six month module, I think that's, that's very difficult. And no, no, I've seen that. I've seen that, especially with, with mathematics. mathematics goes on at university level um, where students just don't believe they have the ability to do that. Mm. Um, and what I hear you saying is just telling them, no, but actually you can, that, that's not a solution. There's another way and that is mm. um, allowing them to grow. I, I think it's true to a certain extent. Um, I don't think I will ever be able to play cricket well. Some of those things are just too late. It's too late <laughs> for me. So I, I think it depends. I mean, there are some of these things that I'm thinking about strength finder, which I did read that book you know where you do the test and then you realize what you are good at um but i'm not going to elaborate on the the principle i do believe it's it's possible for every any person to achieve anything but 
depending on what your zero base is, mm-hmm. will depend how much effort will be required. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there are people who are naturally talented to have ball sense. And it's, it's, it's an inborn ability. And they can do anything. Yes, and even you can use the growth approach, growth mindset approach, but they will reach it much earlier. Yes. Some people, I mean, and, and I sometimes just like, no, uh, we can send you for cricket lessons every single day of the week and try to boost you. I, I just don't think it's a physical ability that you have. Um, so I, I think it, it depends. It, it depends on, 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 on what this thing is. But what I do believe from a teaching point of view, I believe that I'm not talking about theory. I'm talking about understanding and grasping things. I do believe that a good teacher will be able to break that down to make it simple enough that any person can understand that. Mm. And from that perspective, I will agree with this setup. And that's why I will say a, a growth mindset will be good in that case. Mm. I'm thinking about physical abilities. I think that might be a bit, bit tricky. That's mm. just my, my take. No, no, I like it. I like it. But, but yeah, it's definitely, I like the fact that you put it the zero base, where you start from. Yes, where you start from. Yeah, the, the amount of effort it will take you to develop a certain skill will differ. And the level to which you can rise will also differ. Um, but with something like, like maths, um, depending on the teacher, the passion and, and your mindset, because it's got rules and it works a certain way, yes. it's just about understanding that. Exactly. So, and talk about maths, one thing very regularly stumble upon is I love languages. So that's, that's one of the things that I love. I and thought you were going to say I love speak. lamb. Like Rick <laughs> It's kind of a big deal. No, the, the thing is that I love languages. Uh-huh. And then I come across people and they would tell me, oh, Cornelius, you are so clever. And, you've, and I'm like, no, 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 no. And then they would make a statement saying, I will never be able to learn another language. So that's a fixed mindset. Yes, right? And I question that always. I'm just like, that's nonsense. And then they would say things like, I want to talk that language. I also want to speak. I don't want to talk that. I want to talk that language. I want to speak that language. And I'm like, no, you're lying to yourself. Because if you really wanted to speak that language, you would have already gotten some sort of online course or textbooks set aside a certain amount of hours to do that every day. I think that that perhaps fits in here. We mm. also have this idea that it's a gift. So it just yes. falls upon you and then you can speak another language. That's not true. If people ask me, you could also speak good German. I will tell them, yes, because I've been speaking it for more than 20 years. If you do something for more than 20 years and it did not start off with me speaking like that, it started off with doing that learning all the rules, all the grammar, and it was hard. It was tough. You had to memorize those things. Now I'm glad I memorized it because I apply it every day. But that's a, a more simple language because it's Germanic language to me as an Afrikaans speaking person. But the long and the short is with everything, like language specifically now. Mindset, change it, put in the effort, and you do that. And, and, and I think what, what's, what's, what's true, people will make statements like, yeah, but I'm not a language person. Or I'm not a maths person. Yep. You must just find that niche. Just, just yeah. find or that I'm niche not creative. and you'll be able to do that. Exactly. And that's nonsense. That It's a creative statement. But yeah, so the, the point is, uh, that negative speak is, 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 is not, it's, it's not good. I don't like my negative speak. Yeah. That, that makes me mad. I get really negative speak. Yeah, I do. I'm just like, you are right. You will never speak a language. I will just then tell it to them. If they want to believe that about themselves, who am I to disagree? <laughs> then I'm just like, you are 100% correct. Because yeah. if that's your mindset, you'll never reach it in any Yes. Case. Yes. Yeah. If you believe you, 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 is it Henry Ford who said, if you believe, whether you believe you can or yes. you believe you cannot, you are right. Tom cannot, you are right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Whether he said that, I've never checked that. You know, that's one thing. You get all these quotes online and then it's attributed to these people. And I, the, the last couple of months, I've been really checking that. So I will check that whether he really said that. Yes. And you know what's the thing? People just quote these quotes and then just continue. And then it is, it was Henry Ford. But yeah. was it my, really? Did he really say that? My approach is, good. <laughs> the person is not certain of who said it, I claim it. No, it was me. Oh, that's good. So, yes, homie, you said, Henry, you said this. And I go on to Wikipedia and I put, uh, add a quote there in my name. Quotable quotes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, uh, do you know Tim Ferriss? 
He, he wrote the uh, four-hour work week, the four-hour body. I've heard about those books. Of What's that the second one? The second one? The four-hour body one? and the four-hour chef. So he did I've heard about the four-hour four hour work week. I've heard about that. Yeah. Like that, though. But anyway, you, you love languages, and he's developed a way to, to learn languages within six months. He's developed a system. So please go check out Tim Ferriss. I'll check Ferriss and Carol Wick. Is it Carol Wick? Carol Dweck. Well, Dweck, not Wick like John Wick. No. D Carol D W E C K, Dweck. Oh. Like Dweck. skateboard oh, okay. Dweck, but with a W in there. Always need a W in your deck. And then <laughs> Ken Robinson. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you what, what, what's been very influential books in your life? Oh, now I must think. Um, there's one book that I actually read more recently is a book by Floyd McClung. Um, it's one of his last books that he wrote. Uh, the book's name is Leading Like Jesus. Mm -hmm. And what he is stating in that book is the whole upside down kingdom that being a leader is, is, is the whole thing about servant leadership. Mm -hmm. And that book, I've used that so many times over the last couple of months. And we visit schools. We sometimes visit schools for leadership training. And I've realized that is the most difficult thing. For many schools where many of the pupils are professing Christians, they are totally flabbergasted. When you set up this model and you say, well, Jesus said he did not, came, he did not come to, to, to serve, but uh, he did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And everybody will sit there and they will say, oh, that's wonderful. That's great. Amen. That's good. And then we get to the practicality. I'm like, but you're a matrice. And the way in which you will treat the great eights, how does that translate out to this? And suddenly there's this disconnect. It's like, I don't have a problem saying I'm meant to these things, but as soon as it comes to now I have to apply it in my own life. I'm like, no, but no, but it, it does not, it does not work like that. And I'm uh, so that's, that's interesting. So that's, that's one book that I read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're putting me on the spot now with regards to, to, to the books that I've read. If Sorry, I come up you said with other ones, I'll tell you. The stage on the stage, and I like the rhyming by the guy <laughs> on the side. You're a poet and you don't even realize it. <laughs> <laughs> Classic line. Uh, Gunil, thank you. Thank you very much for, for joining us and sharing your perspective on, on teaching specifically, but also on life. Um, my last question is, what do you feel is your superpower? My superpower is to make people laugh. That is an important thing. We need more laughter in this world. So I don't necessarily tell good jokes, but I will laugh at your jokes. And as I laugh for your jokes, everybody will laugh. That's just how life works. So I would say that is, that is my superpower. I agree. You have a very unique laugh, as I'm sure you've been told many, many times. Um, you, you're the only person that I know that can be recognized by their laugh. <laughs> That's good. It's good. It's good because then you don't need to verify this. They will come to you. Yeah. <laughs> Just laugh. They'll come to you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and if people want to contact you, where, where, can, where can they reach you? Where can they follow you? Are you right. on social media? Well, that's a, a very interesting thing. I mean, I'm, I left social media about two, three years ago. So I left Facebook, I left Twitter, and my life is better. And I, I, I must write a book about that, perhaps. Uh, but the long and the short is I've, I've quit social media quite a while ago. And to me, it's much better. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'll be honest. I, I think it's so easy nowadays to get trapped in the like my posts kind of environment and share to be seen and that so i know that's not applicable to everyone but that was definitely something that that it, it had a major impact on my life so i actually you won't find me on on facebook the other day somebody said i saw you on facebook i'm like no that's not me <laughs> and i don't look like that no <laughs> so no i'm not on facebook i'm not on twitter i'm not on linkedin i'm not on these these platforms you can email me at corneels.scabort at gmail.com 
So yes, that's that's what you have. Or my formal university email, corneels.scabord at nwu.ac.za. That's basically where I will be able to be reached. That's, uh, I'm, that's I'm that. sure you can expect an influx of emails <laughs> coming your way with different questions about social media. <laughs> <laughs> it's very easy. You must send a message to Facebook. It takes two weeks, then they deactivate your account forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Gordon Hills. Thank you for being on. Uh, on thank you very much, Hobie. Um, yes. Wish you all the best. Bye bye. It's a pleasure. Bye.